So while I'm waiting for the questions, I have a few doubts, uh, especially like they're connected partially to uh, the clarificatory question Vincenzo did during the presentation. And I guess also uh, to the point Patricia made. So going back to the concept of ingenuity, uh, mm -hmm. so at least in my perspective, the argument has a, like a, a flaw. So it doesn't keep in consideration the practical aspects of when we decide to solve a certain problem or another. So, so I'll try to reconstruct the argument to see if I understood it. So Gödel's argument is that, okay, uh, if the steps that are required to solve the problems are polynomial and a certain polynomial, we also have to check if they're tractable in the sense that uh, you, you feed the machine uh, a large enough N for which if the machine doesn't is not a, a, able to solve the problem for that and it doesn't make any sense to solve it as a from a human perspective mm -hmm. okay is it the, is it like well, this roughly I mean, I mean i mean not that it doesn't make any sense but that i mean you could do it but it's just the point is that the point is that if n is large enough it might take multiple lifetimes to solve it okay yeah or maybe maybe like maybe thousands of lifetimes to, to solve it from from a human point of view and so the point is uh, is a purely pragmatic one. So I think he's he's just saying from the point of view of what we're actually able to do, we can pragmat from effectively in a, in a pragmatic sense of effectively consider that problem to not that that proposition to not be provable. Yeah, and no human being could prove it. Yeah. So then ingenuity came into the picture because the 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 point was like we think that human being do not use only computations to solve problems, but they exactly. also employ ingenuity. Exactly. And and we rejected this point by saying, well, uh, if it, if the problem is like polynomial, the machine could solve it like without ingenuity. So it doesn't play a big role into the proof. Mm -hmm. But then my, my idea is that, okay, but if we look at it from a practical perspective, so yes, the machine could solve it in principle, but then we are the ones deciding which problems are solved by the machines. It's not like there's machines running on every possible problem and they mm -hmm. will eventually find a, a solution. Right. So again, I, I believe that ingenuity comes into play there where we can maybe decide that there's, there is a solution to a certain problem even though the machine and like the number of steps we provided to to it uh, couldn't find an answer, I mean, of course, yeah. I, I mean, of course. I mean, so and and so one thing that Gödel says, I don't know if I quoted it explicitly. One one thing he says, we could, for the purposes of this problem, and he mm -hmm. puts in parentheses, aside from the postulation of axioms, you know, like like mm. like like think of think of uh, like like not worry about effectively like. From a human point of view, I think of a problem as unprovable. So again, like Gödel is far from. I mean, Gödel is famous for for affirming something called mathematical intuition and so on. So Gödel is far from denying that 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 that, that human mathematicians have ingenuity. It's very very far from denying it. And and I I mean I don't know what Gödel would say to 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 your argument, but I mean what I would say is that I would I mean I I completely agree. Right. It's, it's but I think the point that he's making is with respect to the particular question. If I get if I if I ask you, I would say, if I give you proposition phi and I say, tell me whether this proposition is provable or improvable or not provable, mm -hmm. then with respect to that question that I asked you, if the number of steps and if if we if we if we say that I want you to find a proof of length less than or equal to n, mm -hmm. then if n is large enough with respect to that specific question, then the, then we we don't need you. <laughs> we we can just we can just yeah, tell yeah. That. that that's that's the point, right? It's not it's 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 restricted it's restricted to that. It's not it's it's not it's not a general claim that ingenuity doesn't matter at all in mathematics. It's it's a it's a claim that ingenuity doesn't matter in that specific context where we have a particular proposition that we want to prove. Of course. Of course, I completely agree. We have to choose which propositions we want to prove and which ones we don't want to prove. Of mm. course, that's true. But with respect, but once we have made that decision, like, oh yeah, in, yeah, I, I from agree. That point of view, yeah. Gödel's argument uh, would would seem to suggest that we don't we don't uh, we can we can think of ingenuity as irrelevant from that particular mm -hmm. question. 
Of course, I mean, we don't actually think that ingenuity is irrelevant because we don't think that P is equal to NP, right? Yeah. And in fact, I mean, I mean, that, I mean, that's one of the, I mean, there's no proof that P is equal to NP, but one of the reasons people don't believe it is because it would make it would it would make it the case that ingenuity is not important, and that seems wrong. Yeah. But I think is there a better argument for it seems wrong? I'm not sure, but but that's one of the that's one of the reasons that people are at least motivated to think that P is not equal to NP. Okay, thank you. And now we have a question from uh, Vincenzo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, also for this uh, last lecture. Uh, I can say now that uh, your four lecture has been a wonderful introduction to the philosophy of quantum computation. So uh, it, it, it's something really important for our school. And uh, in the meantime, controlled uh, Gedel letters. Indeed, uh, Gedel was uh, persuaded that uh, there, is, there, there, there could be a... a a polynomial algorithm to make uh, to to do proof in, in predicate calculus as as is implicit in your presentation and uh, I, I can i say, can one say that uh, as a, um, a summary of your presentation of your last presentation that in a certain sense you save on one side uh, uh, the thesis of the irrelevance of quantum computation for complexity theory, uh, and the, the other, on the other side, the, the clear model dependence of complexity theory. You you could uh, uh, put these two, diff, two, th two, two uh, these two theses that are apparently in conflict uh, in this. Uh, pragmatic uh, term, that is, uh, you say that in certain sense, uh, complexity theory is not a theory, but is uh, a set of, uh, of rules, uh, a set of... Uh, of uh, so, so the, indeed, uh, you don't deny that there is... Uh, that uh, in the thesis, that if... if, uh, uh, if uh, complexity theory is model dependent uh, clearly and the, on one side and uh, quantum computation change uh, complexity theory and uh, and therefore complexity theory is model dependent there is a theoretical conflict and it is possible to solve this conflict saying that the, at the end of the day complexity theory is not a theory, but uh, a set of rules. It's, it's like uh, logic in the Aristotelian framework. It's not a theory, it's not a mathematical theory, it's mathematics, clearly, but at the end of the day, it's something pragmatical. It is a, a good uh, uh, summary of your point of view, this one. Um, so yes, yes and no. Uh, so let me, uh, let me, let me begin with, uh, just briefly with the girdle, I uh, think. So, um, I just want to clarify one point with, with respect specifically to that letter. So I'm not sure, uh, so you may be drawing on other, uh, other writings of Gödel. Mm -hmm. you, you may have been drawing in other writings of Gödel in your comment, but in that specific letter that he wrote to von Neumann, I wouldn't say that Gödel was convinced that, uh, that, that, that the restricted form of the Entscheidungs problem could be solvable efficiently. I wouldn't say he was convinced. Rather, he kind of, I mean, even conjectured is is too strong. Like he put he put the question to von Neumann and was wondering about about uh, von Neumann's opinion, mm -hmm. and he expressed prima facie. He, he expressed to von Neumann that prima facie this conjecture might be plausible. But he, I would not say he was convinced, or even that he was. He would put it strong enough, uh, like as to phrase it as a conjecture in the mathematical sense. So I just wanted to say that, um, just a, just a clarificatory point for the the second one. So I think so. Yes, in a sense, I agree with what you said, but I think I would take issue uh, with the idea that complexity theory is not a theory, but rather a set of rules. I think I think I would call it a theory. 
but um I mean, I think it depends on what, what, I mean, this is something that uh, we can argue about as well. I mean, like, a, like, I don't think anything I said is going, anything I said in the talk is, uh, has, I didn't explicitly say, say that what I, what I mean by a theory is this, but I don't think computability theory or like the, the theory of computation, generally speaking, should be thought of as a theory in the same sense as physics. For instance, right? So traditionally, when we think of physics, we think of we're trying to, at least in the traditional conception of physics, we're trying to identify things in the world and, and what they're made of and how they are. In computability theory, I mean, it's intrinsically about things that we can do, right? It's about problems that we want to solve. So it, so it, it essentially involves us in a way. It like computability theory in general, I would argue. And so I'm, I'm sure that not all of the, everyone share this opinion, but I would argue that that mm -hmm. computability and by extension complexity theory are theories that really involve us intrinsically in a way that 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 other uh, theories of science don't. And so they have this normative character. Mm -hmm. And so, but I would still call them theories, right? I wouldn't want to say that that uh, theories must be theories like physics is like physics physical theories are that where they where they describe things in the world. I think complexity theory is an example where it isn't that isn't what we're doing where the the normative component is really really central and but it's still a theory even even despite that i would think okay thank you very much thank you thanks for the question okay uh are there are there any other questions or comments if not i'll just add a small uh provocatory comment like <laughs> i would actually claim that if you go through the universality principle, I would just assume that BQP is the actual way to go. Okay. And this is because like, if you end up proving that uh, BQP and BPP are equal, well, then you didn't change anything at all. Like mm -hmm. you, you had your original university principle and but if you end up showing that BQP is strictly larger than BPP, then obviously you would you would want BQP to be the the class in your universality principle. Okay. So basically, this is a win-win situation. Like you can just assume BQP in your universality principle, and just whatever comes, you win. So. So, so yeah, so yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can certainly do that. But I, I would say two things. So uh, first of all, so the first thing I, I would say is that, so, so you could say I have a universality thesis that, that's defined with respect to BQP, and that's fine. Of course you can do that. Um, but then in what sense is that gonna be a model independent? Uh, like you're, you're defining this complexity class vis-a-vis -vis characteristics of quantum computers so there's a there's a real there's a real physical component there right mm -hmm. which i think there's a real physical component even in the classical case but especially in the quantum case you know like it's really emphasized that there's a there's, there's a physical aspect to, to it so i wouldn't say that it's a model independent so so mm -hmm. while one might argue in the class in the bpp case that it's model independent in the sense that it it it, it characterizes like the the abstract notion of human computation and so on in the BQP case, you really like even if it's universal, there's still a really strong, a really thicker. There's a much thicker notion of, of model in there than there is in the BPP case. So I would say that on the one hand. On the other hand, I would say, okay, even if even if you wanted to even if you wanted to to to, to go that way, I would I would then ask like, what theoretical work is the universality thesis really doing for you? Mm -hmm. I think the invariance thesis is doing much more theoretical work. Right, the invariance thesis is, is 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 what allows you to actually like organize this this, this conceptual space in a, in a in a much more useful way, I find, because it, there's a model independence built right into it, right? That we don't we don't explicitly state any model; we just assert their interconvertibility, and so like that is a much more useful, especially for a methodological perspective. Uh, principle, I would say, than 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 the universality thesis. So while yes, you could. Uh, have a universality thesis relative to BQP, I would argue you would still lose model independence because there's a thicker notion of model in there. 
And second of all, I'm not sure what the usefulness of, of the old universality thesis or the new one really is. I think the really useful one is the invariance thesis. Okay. Yeah, that's, I get your point. Thank you. Thanks for the question.